Hi, I'm Tim Ronick from Axon Nobel, and I'm currently a board member with the SCRS. And we're here today to talk about corrosion protection. So, you know, we've, we've started with weld through, and then we've talked about the, the epoxy, the etch primer, you know, that's going to kind of be the second step. Third step, if, if we're doing panel replacements, um, probably going to follow that up with a seam sealer. The seam sealer is probably going to happen directly after that epoxy is cured and, 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 and that's taking place. So let's talk about the different options in, in the seam sealers. You know, you've got sprayable seam sealers, you've got 1K versus 2K seam sealers. I mean, there's, there's a ton, a ton of seam sealers on the market. Again, uh, what are the major categories? We have uh, urethanes which are a single part. Uh, these draw, uh, dry by attracting moisture. Uh, they are a, they take a longer to, to dry. Um, so it will, it does have a tendency to look, uh, decrease your, uh, your cycle time a little bit. So you need to look at that, what am I gonna, I'm gonna go back to that quarter panel, rear body panel scenario. Uh, I gotta paint tonight and I got two hours window time, I'm ready to go, I got to seam seal it. Well, I don't think I'd probably use a urethane, I'd probably go to what, either an epoxy or an acrylic, which uses a catalyst to kick it over, uh, and that would get me through that case. But here's where the problems come. Uh, the urethanes are cheaper. So people, you have a tendency to use the urethanes because they, 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 they are cheaper. Uh, where that they don't realize that getting that car done tonight versus tomorrow, they'll make more money. So they spend a little bit more uh, on the epoxy. So in my toolbox, I'm going to have both. And I'm going to look at, as, a, as a repairer, I'm going to look and say, talk to my team member over in the paint department, when do you need this, when do I need to get you this car to get it painted? Oh, I will paint tomorrow afternoon. I would use the urethanes. My painter, my painter comes back today. We can paint tonight. And then I probably go to the epoxies or acrylics. And then they have various subcategories. You know, you have self-leveling seam sealers. Uh, some areas where you have uh, you need overhead where it doesn't drip, so you got to be careful of that. Um, so and some are, have a heavier build to them, so you have to the know the correct. And here's something else: we, we it's tape seam sealers. Uh, you know, it's fairly new on the market. The biggest problem I found out in the industry is that most guys take their fingers and press it down. And they'll stretch it out and it fails. If they learn how to put it on with the proper tools, you can't beat it. So round door uh, hems or hood hems works great. All right. Which is also a, a consideration within this process. Not only the application of the seam sealer, but um, duplicating that factory appearance that was there before you replaced or disturbed that seam sealer. What is your job? Your job as a repairer is to put that car back to its pre-loss condition. And part of that is visuals. And as Kai alluded to, you have a diminished value. Nothing opened up and looking inside a hood and you see on the factory, uh, on the apron where it's a nice, clear in. here's some guy took a brush and brushed it on. I mean, it's a dead giveaway that this car had been fixed. I heard a nice uh, way to describe that. We, our obligation is to put it back to its prior performance, function, and appearance. Those are the three, the three tests, right? And as Kai said, there's different uh, seam sealers and you want to stick within a line so they're all engineered to work together and we don't necessarily have what the OE, OE has. Similar to that, trying to replicate how some of these seam sealers look, whether they be inside a trunk opening or underneath a vehicle, with the texturing or the, the graining that you have to notch as a, a trowel and try and make them all look the same. A lot of this is a, quite an artisan task. It's not like there's a tool made in many cases that totally replicates this, because we're not the factory. That's a, that's a huge challenge that people need to understand that it takes time for them to be able to create these tools and practice and then be able to actually perform that repair. I like to add to that. So a uh, real life scenario is uh, many times when you open up a, a, a packet of seam sealer, whether it be 2K or single part, the whole tube doesn't get used. Sometimes it gets thrown into a bin, a common area, a box, 
And what happens is the next technician will come along and look in that box and pick up whatever they see that may work and use it. It might have an expiration date on it. It may have a different cure time. It may have another component that needs to be added to it. You know, there's all kinds of factors in, in the body shop that you have to be careful with. Uh, the biggest abuse I see is with a 2K uh, type sealer where there's a, a mixed tube added to it is a technician doesn't lay like a four to six inch bead on a piece of cardboard or panel before they start using it. That area is not mixed. And so what happens is some of the failure comes because that product has not been properly catalyzed. You know, so there's a lot of little, you know, things. I mean, you, you think something so simple as applying adhesive could be done, but there's actually training involved to do those things properly. You got to know your products and where they're used. Uh, due to cost factors, there's a number of people in the industry that are looking at using seam sealer between a door skin and an intrusion beam where foam is supposed to be placed. <laughs> I see you raised your eyes. I mean, this is just a recipe for disaster, and people out there don't realize what they're doing. I mean, that seam sealer is not designed for that particular area, but they're putting it in because it's of pricing. And we as an industry need to start to look at these products, understand how they work. And I'll tell you a real good source of information besides the, your particular uh, manufacturer's training programs is, you know, ICAR has a real wonderful course called Corrosion Protection, CPS01. And they really get into a lot of these areas and discuss them. And I think if everybody was working on a car should have that knowledge how to use them, what they do, and so forth. Mm -hmm. At Adobe, um, some manufacturers have like a, a product board uh, that can be hung in the shop. So a quick reference, you know, this product is manufacturer. exactly, yeah, product manufacturer. Uh, we use that, where you can just walk up and say, hey, that's what I want to simulate, this is the product, that's the number. Now, and that's another great uh, resource that's available for, for all the shops. I mean, whatever manufacturers' products you're using, those manufacturers have, have training courses and will provide, in many cases, on-site training to, to your technicians and to your shop about what, what products to use where and, and what situations, you know, not to use them and, and, and those type of things. So I think that's a resource that, that is out there for a lot of shops if they just reach out you know, to those manufacturers uh, that make these products. Let me just add one thing to that. Um, the Alliance program with ICAR. You know, uh, Tim works for Axel Nobel. Uh, they have great training programs. I've been through some of their training courses, and it's great, and you get ICAR credit for it. And not enough shops take advantage of it. Uh, 3M, Fusure, Kent, we all have some sort of alliance program with ICAR where you learn their products, but it also gives you ICAR credit, so it saves you some money. And they're incentivized to do it. You know, ICAR accreditation is a pretty large piece of some insurer vendors' programs. So one of the things that a, a shop really kind of needs to evaluate is within all those processes, how much time is it really taking for each individual process? What's the cumulative total of that time? as well as what's the expense in materials? And does one line really cover all that expense and, and all that time that's, that's been invested in that? If you're looking for more information on this or other topics, visit us on the web. We're the Society of Collision Repair Specialists and you can find us at scrs.com.